Hi, I'm Talia Baroncelli, and you're watching the analysis.news. I'll shortly be joined by Puya Ali Maron for another episode on Iran and the Iranian Revolution. We really can't make these episodes without your support, so please don't forget to go to our website, theanalysis.news, and to hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen. You can also subscribe to our newsletter and to our YouTube channel. That way you won't miss any future episodes. Thank you so much for your support. I'm joined now by Puya Ali Marom. He's a historian on the modern Middle East at MIT and is the author of the book Contesting the Iranian Revolution, The Green Uprisings. Thanks so much for joining me again, Puya. It's great to be back with you. Let's continue the conversation we were having last time and speak about the history of the Iranian Revolution and some of the factors which contributed to the revolution. So I wanted to ask you about the Shah of Iran, Reza Pahlavi, and why he was so such a controversial figure and hated by um, the working class and the burgeoning middle class. Yes, I, I think the, the Shah was nearly universally reviled universally reviled at the time of the revolution. Um, uh, you know, I come from a diaspora community. It's hard for many Iranians here um, to kind of face up to that. But, uh, you know, this is the age of revolution. This is the age of, this is the 70s. This is the age of anti-colonial revolution, um, anti-imperialism. Um, and here was a government in the Middle East that was propped up by imperialism. It was installed by the United States. So naturally it had a legitimacy problem. It was seen as it was seen correctly as being foreign installed. Um, and then at the same time, at the time of revolution throughout the region, uh, here it was, a, a, you know, siding with imperialism and it was also very counter revolutionary. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about this, I'm sure, but a lot of you, people think that the United States wanted him gone. Um, but he was, the bedrock of U.S. Uh, policy in, in the Persian Gulf region, so much so that in the context of the Cold War, when I say the Shah was counter-revolutionary, it was he was dispatching Iranian soldiers to places like Dhofar, Oman, and putting down Marxist rebellions. So, the, the, you know, this is this is kind of how he was in the region. He was hated in the region. Uh, I think uh the really ultra conservative monarchies that were also tied to the United States, like the Saudis were really close to him. Um, but uh the, the he was reviled by the masses in the region and um and the, the population. So here was a population that was either incre increasingly Muslim or Islamist, uh, that saw him as a secular Western puppet government. Uh, a ruler in the country, or, you know, in places like you know, the University of Tehran and the working classes were increasingly left, and they saw him as a uh, <coughs> bulwark against leftism in, in the country. Uh, he really had not, he did not have a lot of allies. Uh, he really had the upper class that really benefited from the regime. They were close to the royal court. They benefited from the regime, and therefore they wanted the status quo to continue. And so when everybody rose up against them, and, and that's really what happened, we, you know, at the time of a country, the country's population was about 30, anywhere between 33 to 35 million people. Uh, the majority of the population revolted against them, and, and his supporters were so few um, that they, when they came out to his defense, um, they were very inconsequential. Right. And he created these really absurd expectations because he said that in raising oil prices in the 70s, he would basically be able to deliver a certain standard of living to this, you know, burgeoning middle class and that they would have the same standard of living as Germany or people in Japan. But that sort of led to his downfall because those economic policies backfired, right? Yeah, so there's a lot of factors uh, to to the revolution. One is that uh, rising expectations, right? So the price of oil skyrockets. It, it wasn't necessarily him doing it. This was this is 1973 when the Syrians and the Egyptians launched a surprise attack um, on Yom Kippur, uh, a surprise attack on Israeli forces that were occupying the Syrian Golan Heights and the Egyptian Sinai, um, and. Uh, 
they, they won the initial battles, but they ended up losing the war and the status quo ante kind of continued, right? The, the Israeli occupation of the Golan and the Sinai endured um, the battle or the war. But one reason why uh, Israel was able to retain uh, its illegal occupation of these territories was because the British and the Americans flied emergency military aid and supplies and armaments to Israel. And this angered America's uh, conservative allies like the Saudis, who were supporting the Syrians and Egyptians in this war. So as a consequence of Western or British and American support for the Israelis in this war, a lot of the oil oil exporting countries of OPEC shut off the valve to such countries, right? Like the United States and Great Britain. The price of oil skyrockets. Uh, Iran paid lip service to the Arab cause in this war, but was at the same time quietly supportive of Israeli of Israel. And also basically said that this conflict between Arabs, uh, the Arabs and, and the Israelis really doesn't have much to do with us. So we're not going to go along with this oil embargo and we're going to continue to export oil in 1973 and onwards. So when the price of oil skyrockets, the Shah really benefits from it. Uh, he benefits from it and, and so does his government. That uh creates and then of course there was this rhetoric before the war about the Shah promising this great civilization, always comparing himself um to to Europeans and the United States. Like it was it's crazy because Iran is very much a country of that region. It's 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 in that region geographically but culturally, linguistically, um and its history is very much integrated into that history, right? A lot of Iran's ancient capitals aren't even within the Iranian territory as we know it today. A lot of it are like in places like Iraq. Linguistically it's closer to Afghanistan and Tajikistan, but also to to the to, to the Arab countries, right? We we share in their script. Uh, you know, the the we, we're much more Iranians are much closer to them in terms of culture and 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 religion as well, or at least the majority of the Iranians are. But the Shah kind of had this Western standard. It was as if Iran was accidentally located in 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 the, in the Middle East, and he he imagined himself airlifting Iran to Europe. And so he promised this great civilization uh, akin to Western European countries. And then when the government was awash with oil wealth and, and then there was, you know, bottlenecks in terms, because Iran did not have the infrastructure. So when the Shah was importing all this, all these goods from, you know, developing countries or developed countries, the ports were not handled to, um, take on this massive import in the country. So those bottlenecks at the, uh, at the ports, this led to uh, economic recession and inflation. So the promise of a great civilization and then the economic recession in the mid 70s onwards um, and, and inflation and all of that uh, really kind of tempered a lot of expectations that angered people because they they obviously saw that the that great civilization that was promised benefited a certain class of people that were close to the government, but the majority and the masses really didn't see that um, promised civilization benefiting them. And so that created anger. You really see that today as well, right? That that growing class disparity. Iran is a very uh, stratified uh, class system. Uh, this is something that existed before the revolution. It may have been hardened after the revolution, but when you, when you see people, you see the government promising something, and then you see a certain small group of people benefiting from that promise, and everybody else is the economic situation is growing worse and worse. That created an explosive situation. That is one factor, though, because we've had economic crises in Iran before that didn't result in revolution. So this is a situation. This is one really, really important factor that led to revolution. It also doesn't explain why the revolution was an Islamic one. This is why it's one of many factors in explaining why the revolution happened and why it ultimately was led by a clergyman. Do you think the Shah at some point was more aware of the stratification of Iranian society? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but if you listen to his interviews in, say, the 60s compared to the 70s, he does sound a bit more antagonistic to the West in the 70s. He almost sounds like a, a nationalist like Mossadegh, basically saying, you know, we need to defend our interests, we are rising the price of oil because we've been taken advantage of and our resources have been exploited. And this is the, the time where we need to actually protect our own interests. Yeah, so the Shah does grow more increasingly confident in the late 70s. Typically, the Shah's supporters in the diaspora committee look to his confidence as reason for why the United States either allowed the revolution to happen, as they put it, or 
um, or, or fomented the revolution to begin with. Uh, you know, th there's bombastic rhetoric and there's policy. The Shah spoke of, um, he, he, you can see his interviews in the late seventies. He's very confident talking about race. Now all of us, you know, he's, he imagined Iran, at least ethnic Persians as white and he called himself the light of the Aryans. But now all of a sudden in the late seventies, he's talking about Iranians being brown eyed and, 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 you know, talking a little bit more about slight differences in his mind. There's much more than slight differences in terms of ethnicity between Iranians and Europeans. But now he's talking about those slight differences and he, he's growing increasingly bold. And, and uh, he, he is now in the late seventies, maybe one of the impetuses, impeti for the increase in, in the price of oil. But that's not, if, if the core issue is, is that the reason why, um, supposedly the u.s or the or the west facilitated this revolution that that is not it right um we have a tendency to look at history backwards uh he did have cancer that cancer was not terminal um and he i think the united states did not know about it at the time right so people now say he had he was dying of cancer and that's why the United States may have wanted the revolution because they wanted to have a, a fierce anti-communist in power. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if the United States knew that he had cancer. It was a big state secret. And also he didn't die of cancer. He died of um, poor treatment for that cancer. Right? So uh, when, when you're in exile and you're going from country to country, uh, and the Shah was a celebrity leader in the West, a lot of celebrity doctor hacks were trying to be the one to save him to kind of increase their celebrity status as physicians, and a lot of non-specialists who because he needed an he needed a specialist oncologist to treat him. A lot of really non-specialists jumped into the foray and and started to be part, joined his medical team and started to treat him, and and that's really what caused his demise. Uh, it was sure the cancer, but it was also his treatment. My point in talking about this is is to say that. Um, the United States did not play that role that a lot of Iranians in the West think he did in, in terms of the revolution. The the true cause, or, or, or the United States did play a role in the revolution, but that was, it's not the way we think of it. Uh, his role was propping up a government, instituting a secret police that disallowed any meaningful political participation. And that, those policies created a scenario where the population realized that they can't change the system within and revolution was the only means to change things in the country. Because he was consolidating, I think you mentioned this last time we spoke, he was consolidating the two-party system into a one-party system and not recognizing that he'd be upsetting a lot of the population in, in doing so. Yeah, so that's an important factor, right? So we have the economic uh, factor we discussed about five minutes ago, but you know, the economic factor, the economic development of the country creates a middle class, right? So middle class is important to political activity because, um, you know, typically, I, I don't want to generalize, but typically the poorer classes are too busy, especially in, in third world countries. They're too busy trying to survive. They don't have fridges. They don't have fridges full of food. They're working for their daily bread. The upper classes don't want change typically because the status quo benefits them. It's really the middle class. So the emergence of of a developing economy and, and factories and the emergence of class formation uh, leads to a modern middle class who are now going to universities, modern universities, leaning, learning about those ideas uh, of accountable government, representative government, uh, checks and balances, uh, transparency, and all these things. And then the opposite is happening in real life, where the, the, the Shah's government was, was going in the opposite direction of liberalizing the political space. He had a two-party system that was already very much controlled by the royal court. In history, we call it the yes and yes sir party. And then that was scrapped for a one-party system. So the Shah was going for in the opposite direction. So the the lack of uh, uh, meaningful avenues of political repression, uh, political uh, participation in the system also became a really important factor as to why the population opted for revolution. It still doesn't explain why the revolution was an Islamic one. It still doesn't explain why the revolution was led by a clergyman, but it does explain why they opted for revolution. There's other factors too as to why it was an Islamic revolution ultimately. Right. And in your book, uh, Contesting the Iranian Revolution, you also do discuss 
these issues and engage with the historical literature on the revolution. So I think, you know, this quintessential historian, Ervan Abrahamian, would have explained the revolution through these social formations and class structures, whereas Moadel would have said, you know, ideology is so important to the revolution. And there, there were instances in the past where people were uprising and they had economic grievances, but the revolution itself didn't come about until ideology really took hold. Maybe we can speak about the, the role of the clergy and ideology in facilitating the revolution. Yeah, so so Mansur Mada does in, the, in his book, it's called um, The Iranian Revolution, Class, Politics, and Ideology, right? So he doesn't necessarily contradict. Uh, he doesn't dispute a lot of what Abrahamian says. Abrahamian talks about class, class formation, and his, his theory is really called uneven development. The development of the economy, the emergence of a modern middle class, and then the de-development of the political system, that leads for the modern middle class uh, becoming the incubator of revolutionary change. Moada says, okay, that all, that all is true. It doesn't explain, however, why the revolution was an Islamic one, right? So he then, he then kind of argues that this is... And, and I can, I think he he argues with it in the Iranian context, but there's a regional context too that I like to consider as well as a historian, not just of Iran but of the Middle East. Things happen. Two or three things happen in the Middle East that, uh, not necessarily discredit secular nationalism, but undermine it, right? And then people begin to look for an, uh, an ideological alternative. The most important one in the Iranian context is the overthrow of Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh. As a secular nationalist leader, democratic uh, pedigree, he was overthrown by U.S.-British coup. So that does two things. One is that it, it shows that democracy may be a good but when you're a weaker developing world nation, it could be a weapon used against it. Now, give me, I give, this is the example I give all my students. The, the Mossadegh was a through and through Democrat. The CIA bought and paid journalists to write articles against Mossadegh, alleging he was a communist, right? He, by no stretch of the imagination, was Mossadegh a communist. Right. But this was this in a, in a deeply conservative Muslim society in the context of the Cold War. <clears throat> to allege he was a communist uh, worried a lot of conservative Muslims in the 50s in Iran. And so his cabinet members came up to Mossadegh and said, look, these are what the uh, newspapers are writing about you. Do you want us to arrest a journalist or close down the publications? And Mossadegh said, no, they have the freedom of press to publish as they please. Right. So he here is a Democrat who really lived up to that promise. And, and the United States, as the world's oldest democracy, weaponized Mossadegh's commitment to free, freedom of press and democracy and the rule of law against him, right? So that, in a way, kind of did two things to Iranians. One is showed that democracy is a good thing, but maybe when we're, when we're trying to, you know, create a national uh, sovereign country uh, against these dominant, domineering powers, maybe democracy can be a weakness used against us. Maybe we need something different, right? And then also the fact that it was the United States that undermined Mossadegh is a big deal. It wasn't Switzerland. It wasn't Norway. It was the oldest democracy in the world. And, you know, this is a time where the United States was presented. It still presents itself in this way as the beacon of freedom around the world. And then here it is undermining freedom and democracy in Iran. So that changes things for, for not only Iran, but a lot of developing world countries, right? So it, it was a signal. The, the coup in Iran was a signal to other countries that if you're a right wing military leader and you have a bone to pick with a democratically elected government that we also don't like, get in touch with us. We'll help you overthrow that system. So a year later, the Guatemalan military overthrew Jacobo Arbenz's nationalist socialist government in um, in Guatemala, right? So this is one of those things that is it's such a big, the coup is a big deal, doesn't get talked about enough. So this was a defeat of secular nationalism in Iran. In the region, about 14 years later, the poster boy of secular Arab nationalism in the Middle East was Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nasser was then defeated handedly in the Six-Day War, where he was promising uh, victory against Israel. And then within six days, uh, his government and the governments of Syria and Jordan were defeated handedly and territories were lost. 
the, the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the Syrian Golan, Golan Heights, and also the Gaza Strip. All of these were, were illegally occupied by Israel. And that that destroys Nasser. It destroys people still love them, but he was essentially defanged, right? A lot of Islamists uh, across the region had been arguing that, look, you secular leaders think that if you follow the model of Western Europeans and the Americans of secular national constitutions, you think you could be like them. You think you could be as powerful as of them. But that's unique to their cultural and historical trajectory. Our source of strength, they, our source of strength, they argued, is Islam. When we are true to our background and history, Islam was the pinnacle of human civilization at one point. The Islamic golden age was the center of the of the planet, of the center of the world. He's like, it's only when we turned our back on our true source of strength that has ruined us. And when you secular nationalists like Mossad and Nasser and all you types are, are following, you're importing constitutions from Europe and you're implementing it in our societies, you're not only not going to be as strong as them, but you're hastening our ruin. So when Mossad was overthrown and Nasser was basically defeated handedly, they basically said, we told you so. So a lot of ideologues began to develop an, a, an alternative to secular nationalism. And the alternative came to be in the 60s and 70s, political Islam. And the, the likes of Ayatollah Talagani, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, Motahari, and probably most consequentially is Ali Shariati, who was very anti-clerical, but also still an Islamist ide ideologue. Uh, they began to theorize what what an Islam Islamist alternative would be, not just in Iran, but then you had Ayatollah Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr in Iraq, and he's he's a really important theoretician. You had Imam Musa Sadr in Lebanon, and then you have uh, the Sunni ones across the uh, Sunni Muslim world, the majority Muslim world, also propositing these theorists, and then they begin to gain traction in the 60s and 70s. What's really interesting about Iran is that political Islam doesn't be begin with Iran, but it begets a, it's the first time there's an Islamic revolution. And it gives political Islam, doesn't matter if you're Sunni or Shiite, it gives it a big global boost and it gives it credibility. Like it, an argument really goes that even, even like Sunni leaders or, or Sunni Islamists um, were saying that even though we disagree with Shiism, we disagree with Khomeini, we disagree with these Iranians, look what they were able to do by staying true to their faith. They really reduced the Iranian revolution as a matter of faith. They basically said, look at them, look how they were true to their faith, and they brought down one of the third world's most feared and powerful governments, not essentially more or less non-violently. And, and that gives a big boost. And then, of course, the, the post-revolutionary government begins to foster and promote this Islamist alternative as a matter of state policy, right? They they helped to establish Hezbollah in Lebanon. They've been supporting the Palestinians from the get-go of the uh, of the Iranian revolution. The first world leader to visit Iran after the revolution was Yasser Arafat himself, and he came uninvited, uh, and he received the hero's welcome. He is not an Islamist, but then, then the Iranians switched from supporting Yasser Arafat to supporting Hamas and Islamic Jihad afterwards. And at what point does Khomeini become this figure to contend with? Like, was that in the, in the 60s, maybe, 1963, in response to the white revolution of the Shah, which gave women um, the right to vote? Yeah, so, it, it, you know, I, I tell you all these things from the position of someone who, who deals with the Iranian diaspora. So I, I've grown up in a community that talks about Khomeini as if he came out of nowhere. And he took over the revolution from France, and he commandeered it from France. And that's that's not true. Khomeini was arrested in 1963. He was exiled shortly afterwards. He, you know, he he led the first real uprising against the Shah uh, in the 1960s. Uh, incidentally, a lot of university students who may not have been followers of Khomeini, who were members of the National Front, Mossadegh's National Front, or Bazaigan's Liberation Movement. They saw uh, Khomeini and this uprising, and they saw how ruthless the Shah's government was in putting it down and ultimately exiling Khomeini. And they made two conclusions from that. Um, these university students that later came to form guerrilla organizations to fight the Shah's government in the 70s, they formed two conclusions. And the first one was, 
that non-violent protest against the Shah is futile because the Shah is armed to the teeth, back to the backed by the United States, and it used those weapons against non-violent de- demonstrator, demonstrators in the Khomeini-led uprising. And two, they concluded that no matter how we feel personally about the clergy, because both of these guerrilla organizations that emerged in the 70s were anti-clerical, they said that the clergy has a role to play in the revolutionary struggle against the Shah. So when Khomeini was exiled in 1960, I think it was like 64, ultimately, he first goes to Turkey. He, everyone thinks he goes to Iraq. He doesn't go to Iraq. He goes to Turkey for three months. And, and this is, this is a, a Kemalist ideological state in Turkey that the Pahlavi dynasty, the two monarch Pahlavi dynasty that ultimately exiled Khomeini, they looked up to that Kemalist ideology. So Khomeini goes to Turkey for three months and he's like, holy smokes. And that was a pun, by the way. He says, holy smokes, if we don't, if we don't stop this, this dynasty in Iran, Iran could become like Turkey even more, super secular. And so, <clears throat> so he leaves Turkey because he doesn't find that kind of environment acceptable as a conservative clergyman. And he goes to, to none other, none other than Najaf, Iraq, right? The, the shrine city devoted to the first Shiite Imam, Imam Ali. He goes there and he's there for 14 years, you know, fomenting this opposition to the Shah. The, you know, he's one important opposition force against the Shah. He's not the only one. And then, he, you know, people say, oh, the, the France was involved in this revolution because ultimately Khomeini flew in to Iran for, on an Air France, um, air civilian airplane. But what ends up happening was Saddam Hussein, uh, it, when the revolution is underway in Iran, and, and Saddam is a leader of Iraq, and he's now housing Khomeini, he contacts the Shah and says, look, we, me and you have had differences in the past, but I have a common enemy with you in Khomeini. I don't want this revolution to succeed because as one of the only other Shiite majority countries that neighbors Iran, of course, and has a, has my own Islamist Shiite opposition in this country underground, I don't want to see this revolution in Iran succeed in overthrowing you despite our differences. I can make him disappear for you. And the Shah basically says, I don't want you to make a martyr out of him. It was the Shah's decision. And the Shah says, how about you exile him? Because, because he's in Najaf, Iraq. And because so many Iranians go on pilgrimage to Najaf, Iraq. And he's so close to Iran by virtue of his geography, as in, in, because he's in a neighboring country now. And Iranians have been coming and going from Najaf, Iraq for hundreds of years. So like the routes are very established, right? He's like, I, and of course, now they're smuggling in tapes of his sermons, too, in the Iranian revolution. So the Iranians are learning, even if they're illiterate, because a lot of Iranians were illiterate at the time of the revolution. They're able to hear Khomeini's sermons. And, and now he's being centered in their opposition by virtue of those sermons. The Shah asks Saddam to exile him. And so the Iranians around him and the supporters of the revolution had really been based in three Western cities, Berlin, Paris, and Berkeley, California. So those who had contacts um, wanted Khomeini to go to their location. So within the people around him, there were, there were people competing for Khomeini's good graces. And ultimately, those who were able to argue for him to go to Paris, and Nofle Chateau in Paris, won. And that's how he ends up in Paris. So it wasn't this like Western conspiracy. It was the Shah's own decision to ask Saddam to, to exile him. And he ends up in, in Paris. And then in Paris, he's giving these really like political, um, maybe even liberal speeches about, you know, how he does, he may not want to rule Iran and how he, he promises freedom, all these very general things that everyone could get behind. Um, and then this is when, <clears throat> around this time is when the United States is secretly in touch with this, with Khomeini. The, the Iranian government denies all this. Um, but the, the ideal really was to get to, to see the, the United States did not want to sh- see the Shah fall. The Shah was the guarantor of security in the Persian Gulf. And he was buying billions of dollars of military equipment from the United States. He was <clears throat> cracking down on communists left and right. They loved him. 
right? He he allowed Iran to be a listening post that was because at the time Iran bordered the Soviet Union, and uh, they allowed the Shah allowed the United States, the United States to to set up a listening posts to be able to spy on the Soviets from Iranian territory, and so. Um, but they ended up contacting Khomeini really to see what he was like and maybe to establish a relationship with him because they wanted to hedge their bets. If the Shah falls, we want to make sure the person coming to power afterwards um, is not going to be fiercely anti-America. And Khomeini may have led them to believe that he wasn't going to be this anti-American force. But that that's a very different thing than... than Carter let the revolution happen or Carter brought Khomeini to power because that's the that's the narrative oftentimes right well a, a lot of what you're talking about was made apparent in um, the documents that were released by the National Security Archive in, in 2016 I believe which showed some of the correspondence between um, Khomeini and Jimmy Carter and how you know Jimmy Carter was trying to keep this under wraps he wanted to give this impression that he definitely still, supported the Shah, was behind the Shah 100%, but was perhaps looking at other avenues to maybe support Khomeini in the event that the Shah would fall and they, they would have this, you know, communist threat to deal with it as well. Um, so we've talked about this a bit, but to what extent do you think Carter, I don't want to say facilitated the revolution, but helped Khomeini because he did allow Khomeini to go back to Iran once the Shah basically had to leave. So I think this was like January 16th. Uh, well, the Shah had to leave January 16th, 1979. So following that, he made it possible for Khomeini to go back to Iran. And to what extent do you think Carter and p potentially his national security... Well, I, 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 I want to know, what, what, what do you mean by when you say Carter made it possible for Khomeini to return? That's, that's a certain language that I want to understand. So what I mean by that is how he he sent, I think, a general, Robert Heuser, to Iran to speak to the military groups or, or the military in Iran to ensure that when Khomeini would return, there wouldn't be a massive uprising. No, so, 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 so they, he, 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 sorry to cut you off, but he dispatched, Carter dispatched General Heuser. By the way, Heuser is his name that every Iranian of that generation knows like it's like it's somebody that was in their family because this this guy is so important to the story of the revolution. General Hoyer goes to Iran to assess the potential of a military coup and a full-scale military crackdown on the revolution. And he wanted to basically go because when you want when you want to do a military coup and stamp out a mass revolutionary uprising against you, you, you got to figure out first of all what the potential is that the military will actually open fire and stay a coherent military and not deal with defections. One. Two is that you're going to have to conduct mass arrests as well. So you need to have the infrastructure for that. So how many prisons does the country have? How many of them are, are full to capacity? How, how many of them are beyond capacity because they're just overflowing with political prisoners? What would be... Uh, you know what would happen how many people would have to die in this crackdown like if we could if it's five thousand we could tolerate it if it's hundred thousand too much if it's a million i don't know if we could do that so hoyer goes to iran to assess what was possible for military crackdown and coup against the revolution and he comes back and says it's impossible the entire country is is on is revolting the prisons are full beyond capacity a military crackdown and coup would not be possible unless it's going to be mass mass bloodshed like i'm talking about killings of hundreds of thousands and more people and they do realize they can't do it but but think of it think of it though a general had to go think about like what we're talking about here and an american general had to go this is this is how how beholden the Shah was to the United States that an American general had to go to Iran to assess whether a, a military coup and crackdown was something that could be done to prevent this regime from falling, and and then the, an American general assessed that it was impossible. Let's let's stop to recognize how beholden and dependent the Shah was to the United States and to their leadership. And to their advice, um, there was the U.S. ambassador to Tehran, William Sullivan. The Shah was meeting with him all the time, didn't know what to do. 
how indecisive he was, and also how massive this revolution was. That the the a, a, a American general who doesn't care about Iranians, by the way, he cares about American policy in Iran. So he's not feeling sorry for Iranians. Assess that there's going to have to be mass bloodshed and that is not sustainable. So if it was going to be 10 or 15,000, he would have been like, yeah, we could do it. It's possible. We could back it. So, but he, you know, the ultimate decision was it just wasn't feasible. So the Carter was supporting the Shah to the bitter end. Uh, and he's dispatched a general to, f- to figure out what was possible. The one thing that I think carries a little bit of water, and even then we have to discuss it, was that Carter put pressure on the Shah to liberalize the political space. And that led to a burst in revolutionary activity. And even that is historically problematic. The reason why people say this is because Carter as a candidate, this is the 1970s, so you got to place it in that time period. This is the age of anti-war America, anti-Vietnam War. So the United States withdraws in defeat from Vietnam in 1973. In 1975, the North marches on the South and forcibly unifies Vietnam. Four years later, or three years later, because the revolution begins in 78, Carter comes, up, comes up, I think he wins, wins office in 77. Carter represents that anti-war America that was burned by the Vietnam War. So his whole campaign was about peace and human rights. And he talked a lot about, as an, as an America that has close relationships with a lot of human rights violating regimes, we have to make sure that we're putting pressure on allies that are buying weapons from us to uphold the higher standard. And he often talked about Iran. Because it's easy to criticize human rights violating regimes that are our enemies, right? But when we have a relationship or we're sustaining and arming a human rights violating regime, that's different when we're now talking about human rights in those countries, right? So Carter runs on a human rights platform, and that resonated with Americans at that time, and he wins office. The Shah hated that his name and his government were being dragged in the mud in that campaign, right? He was very sensitive to Western press. Very, his One of his dreams was to be man of the year on Time magazine. Incidentally, it was Mossad that was man of the year, and then Khomeini after him. Uh, Khomeini, obviously not for the right for good reasons. Sometimes you could be man of the year. At the time, it was man of the year. Now it's person of the year. You could be man of the year for, for infamous reasons as well. But th- this is how sensitive the Shah was to Western approval, Western media attention, Western criticism, that he wanted to be man of the year at Time magazine. And he hated that Carter dragged uh, his government's name in the mud. So when Carter won the presidency, without Carter putting pressure on the Shah, the Shah began to, to liberalize a little bit the political space. But again, there's a difference between campaigning and policy, right? So Carter, when he was campaigning on human rights, didn't really pressure the Shah. In fact, when he became president, New Year's Eve, he flies to Iran and toasts the Shah, a very infamous toast that he basically says, you know, your government is an island of stability in, in an otherwise turbulent part of the world. And that's a testament to your leadership, the Shah, and the love your people have for you. So because of the campaigning he did as a candidate, that he felt like he had to fly to Iran on New Year's Eve, not just any day. There's a U.S. president flying to Tehran on New Year's Eve to toast the Shah to really make amends. And this is why a lot of Iranians hated Carter, because they saw him as a hypocrite. Here he is talking about human rights as a candidate, and now he's flying and toasting the Shah on New Year's Eve and uh, bestowing American legitimacy onto the Shah and talking about his great leadership. This is why the revolution was very much against not just the Shah, but against Carter. And that hypocrisy is is very common to candidates versus, versus actual office holders. Trump did this too. Trump, as candidate, talked about Saudi Arabia being behind 9-11 uh, and all, he dragged Saudi Arabia's government through the its name through the mud first trip abroad as president he goes to saudi arabia signs a 110 billion dollar arms agreement with the with the um saudi you know royal family or, or the saudi government so carter was like trump in the sense that he talked about something but as president did something completely different so there's some people that say 
uh, the Carter put pressure on the Shah to liberalize, and they blame Carter for the revolution. And even that is not true. Carter never. Carter talked about it, but didn't really pressure the Shah and flew to Tehran and toasted the Shah uh, to his great so-called great leadership. Well, Carter is a very difficult person to sort of pin down in terms of his politics, because you, you hear some Iranians in the diaspora also saying that it was because of Carter that you know, Khomeini came to power, which is based on what you're saying, not accurate, but I guess I just want to reiterate or, or pose the question again, like to what extent do you think his uh, national security advisor, um, Brzezinski and the other people around him, like Cyrus Vance, like to what extent did they change his mind to potentially support Khomeini? And another thing is they did give Khomeini the green light to change the constitution from a constitutional monarchy to a republic. I, I still don't know what that means. Like when Khomeini came to, when he arrived in Iran in February 1st, 1979, he wasn't looking for green lights for everybody. This was a super confident, zealous, um, pretty calm, like Zen leader, fierce, and also ruthless. He wasn't looking for permission from anybody. He's, he's the one that when the seizure of the U.S. embassy happened, he said, oh, America can't do a damn thing. Right, but maybe he changed his rhetoric, like leading up to the revolution, he did reassure in, in secret communication with Carter, like he reassured that he would he, not He did. He basically did do that. US. That's him. That's him saying that, like, don't get in our way. That's that. That's saying we're not going to be anti-U.S. policy or anti-imperialism. In, in the region or in Iran, it's such a big difference than saying the United States gave him the green light to change the constitution, right? The, 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 the Iranian government used the seizure, the, the international crisis of the seizure of the U.S. embassy to pass the constitution because the, the seizure of the embassy was November, November 4th, 1979. The referendum on the constitution happened at the end of November, the same month. And, um, and Khomeini basically said, the, so this is when you say the United States allowed him to do this or gave him the green light to change his constitution. Khomeini basically said the imperialists are at the door. We've seized their embassy to to ward off a counter revolution at the hands of the United States. They're at the door now, and passing this constitution is a no slap in the face in the mouth of the United States and imperialism. So they used the seizure of the U.S. embassy. The the government. In Iran, they use the crisis to rally support against the United States and for the Constitution. They did the same thing when post-revolutionary factions began fighting each other in a low-scale civil war at the time of the Iraqi invasion. Khomeini and the government basically said, "If you're going to criticize us now, this is the 19, early 1980s. If you're going to criticize us now, when the Iraqis backed by everybody." are invading our country. You're siding with them. So they use these crises to, to consolidate first the constitution and then the clerical government and domination in the context of the early phases of the Iran-Iraq war. Now, I wouldn't say these are green lights from anybody, though. All right. Well, I wanted to speak to you about um, the Communist Party today and its role in the revolution because we haven't full-on address their role yet. And I think if you look at what happened prior to the revolution, the, the Marxist-Leninists were sort of shoulder to shoulder with the clergy, and it wasn't so apparent at the time that they would be marginalized. And I was recently listening to, um, I think his name is Abbas Milani, who was a, a Marxist-Leninist at the time. Maybe he can be characterized as a neocon now, but if you listen to his interviews, he was basically saying that he was imprisoned with the Ayatollahs, um, people like Rafsanjani, and if you had told them that the clerics would have been the ones who would have been in charge of the revolution and controlling the government afterwards, they would have just like laughed in their face or laughed in his face. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Milani was a political prisoner, I think, from before the revolution at the hands of the Shah, and I think after the revolution at the hands of the of the Islamic Republic. I think I know for sure before. I think he was. I think he was a political prisoner in both. Um, but when he says that when he was in prison with with 
these clergymen who came to be leaders of the Islamic Republic after the revolution. And he says that, um, he, he did not, he was stuck. He, if you told him at the time of his political imprisonment that these cellmates of his or his prison mates would be leaders, he wouldn't have believed it. Uh, that, that's a little bit of a subjective experience, right? So, um, you know, again, like this is the era of revolution and the era of the defeat of secular nationalism and the emergence of an Islamist alternative, not just in Iran, but across the region. Um, I think it depends on who you were and, and, and what place you were in, right? And who your circle was, right? We have, we all, there's echo chambers even back then. So my father, for instance, was a University of Tehran, a University of Tehran left leaning, very left leaning university student. At the university that was a bastion of leftism in the country, to him it, it did not occur to him at all that it, uh, uh, he was very anti Shaw. It didn't occur to him and many of his friends and everyone he hung out with because he's not going to go hang out with a religious person as a secular leftist. It didn't occur to any of him or his friends that the clergy would come to dominate power afterwards. To the clergy that had been who who first led this uh, or lit the spark against the Shah in 19, in the 1960s and, and then led to Khomeini's exile. Uh, for them, the revolution began not in 78, but in 63 and 64. So it depends on who you talk to, right? The Trude had been on the scene for a long time, but the Shah was anti-communist fiercely. And that's why the United States loved him and also helped him establish the secret police, Samak, to hunt down communists. So, um, the Tudeh essentially was in exile at the time of the revolution. Uh, and then a lot of the guerrilla organizations that emerged in the early seventies, uh, by the mid seventies, the, they were all, they were both left. One was left leaning Marxist Leninist. And the other one was, uh, there was a lot of guerrilla organizations. There's two main ones. One was Marxist Leninist and one was Marxist Islamist. And people think there's a contradiction in that. And there really isn't. Um, but these, these two organizations emerged in the 60s, really began their guerrilla war in 1971 and onwards. And by the mid-70s, they were essentially dismantled. Uh, many of the core leaders either had died fighting the Shah's secret police or had died in infighting. Uh, and many of them existed, the, many of the surviving leadership existed in the prisons. So, um, you know, and, and Milani was in prison too as a leftist. You know, that should tell you something. Um, but again, so was the clergy, right? So that there's this thing that people say that um, one of the factors, and this is this, there's a bit of truth to this, one of the factors to the revolution becoming Islamist was because the Shah tolerated an Islamist alternative and tolerated religion and helped, um, you know, maybe bankroll the creation of mosques and those spaces or didn't get in their way uh, because he thought the country becoming more religious meant that they can't be Marxist. Right? How could you believe in God and also be an atheist? So, um, so the, one of the factors is that he call, he allowed the either he allowed or he cultivated religion, um, not because he was devout himself. I mean, he was, but he would he wasn't really fond of the clergy. But uh, but that it, you know that's a part of the story of the revolution, but not the entire part because all of those leaders. All those clergymen, like Rafsanjani, Ayatollah Montazir, Khomeini, and all them, were also imprisoned or exiled too. So it wasn't like the clergy had a free hand to launch the revolution. The, there was a free hand to preach religion and to create those spaces. And the most famous of all is Hosseini Ershad in, in Tehran. This is when, in the early seventies, when Ali Shayati began to present Islam as a as a as a revolutionary. Um, you know, ideology and not just religion against the clergy. And he ultimately was exiled too to, to London where he died in 1977 uh, at the age of like 41. Um, but, you know, the story of Islam as an alternative is important. Uh, it doesn't explain why the clergy fully came to power because they too were, were dealing with political repression. So Milani met with some of them in prison, uh, should, should tell you about. They, were, they did not have a fully free hand to, to mobilize against this revolution. It's a lot of factors at once. So why was the left marginalized then? I mean, were they just very fragmented or can this be explained? No, I think it has to do with, I think it has to do with the priority of the repression, 
So for for the state, the 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 number one enemy wasn't necessarily the clergy; it was the secular uh, left and the guerrilla organizations, right? So that that was the priority, and and then they, they were dis- essentially dismantled or exiled, right? Uh, and then you know the clergy are are vast, so you could exile and imprison some of them, but they're going to still be in the country. They're part of a nationwide network, you know, and not all clergy are militant for sure. But in the in the in the as the revolution begins to unfold, those more politically quiet because the clergy themselves, they're essentially politically quiet test clergy who don't want to be involved in politics because that's corrupting. And also, if if clergy are, are involved in politics and they get something wrong, that's gonna, um, uh, what do you call it? Sully the name of the clergy and the religion. So there's a tradition within uh, uh, clergy in Iran or anywhere to not be involved in politics. And then there's the extreme opposite, the more militant clergy. And so in the in the revolution, the more militant clergy and their students began to shame and name the more politically quiet test. Um, clergy and get them on board with the revolution. So that what that's what happened. So, you know, I would say that one reason why the left was was important to the revolution. I, I don't want to downplay it. I think it was Ayatollah Beheshti himself who said that um, that the revolution happened because of Khomeini, Shariati, and one of the guerrilla organizations. He actually said that, right? Because even when the Shah flees the country, he left his regime intact and the military in power, essentially. Um, and then Khomeini returns two weeks later, February 1st. And then there's a 10-day period between Khomeini setting up a rival government by virtue of just his edicts, right? And then the Shah's government is still in power. The, the more Khomeini stays in Iran, the more people come and pledge their fealty to him. So the power of the Shah's government is slowly uh, decreasing and the home, people increasingly are coming to pay homage to Khomeini and recognize his leadership. So the the power of one is decreasing, the power of the other one is increasing. And then on the last two days, I think February 10th or 9th, 10th and 11th, two guerrilla organizations begin a armed insurrection to finish off the regime. Uh, and that's one of the things that, that's so interesting about the Iranian revolution compared to the Arab Spring uprisings is that it was total the revolution laid waste to everything about that regime. It took it took over the radio, all the media in the country. It freed the all the political prisoners were released, and then of course there, many of them were put back, and then some. Um, all the weapons were distributed. Like the state had, it's not like the United States or, or where you have a, a right to bear arms. There's no right to bear arms. The state has a monopoly on violence. All of a sudden. Uh, armed guerrilla groups were, were going and taking over the weapons depots and just distributing arms. So my paternal uncle was one of those young, like, I don't know, like 18, 19 year olds who was now all of a sudden going and taking weapons and he had weapons. And then when the post-revolutionary government was trying to consolidate his power, it basically said everyone who took weapons has to return them because they didn't want an armed civilian population. And so my uncle was afraid of returning the guns because then he would be suspected of being a, a left-leaning guerrilla. Because did you steal the guns from the Shah, or did you have them before? And if you had them before, does that mean you were part of these guerrilla organizations? So he buried them in his backyard. <laughs> so I, I suspect if you go to Iran, you're going to see, a, you could dig up a lot of really rusty, you know, dysfunctional weapons in a lot of backyards. <laughs> but... Um, but this is what the revolution was total in that sense. The, the entire government collapsed. The, and then a new system was emerged that created multiple parallel military uh, security forces like the Basij militia, paramilitaries, like the IRGC. It changed the phys- physical and aesthetic landscape of the country. It changed the names of the streets. You had streets literally devoted to kings and queens and and presidents of the West. They were now changed to like Malcolm X Boulevard, uh, Bobby Sands Boulevard, where the U- British Embassy is, Bobby Sands being an IRA political prisoner that died on hunger strike. Uh, like it became this revolutionary state with revolutionary names, Islamists, and revolutionary names across the country. The aesthetic, everything changes. The curriculum changes. The universities were closed down. Cultural revolutions take place. Left leaning students and professors and deans were all fired or, or kicked out of school. Um, the curriculum, everything, the, the way people address are now being, everything changes. 
the Arab Spring uprisings were not anywhere near total like that. And, and, and in a way, that's one of their failures because the power structure remained. If the figurehead fell, like in, in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak fell, nothing else really changed. So the power structure that gave birth to the likes of Hosni Mubarak remained in power and they just brought somebody else, like another, another general in the form of General Sisi. Do you think that the violence of the revolution could have been sort of predicted from before? I mean, we were speaking about this uh, uh, right before the, the interview started and you were saying like it wasn't a foregone conclusion, right? So when did this reformist movement start among the Ayatollahs, basically saying that the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic was being undermined by the regime actually imprisoning all these people and even killing them? Okay, so yeah, let me try to understand the question because um, I feel like there's two. One is one deals with the seven late seventies and early eighties, and the other one deals with two thousand nine. Am I am I understanding this correctly, or or the late nineties and early two thousands? Well, I'm not sure when. Um, I think it was Montazeri when he was critical of the the violence at the very initial stages of the revolution, like in the early eighties and imprisoning. Yeah. So. So that, that's not the violence in the early stages of the revolution. The violence in the early, the, the post-revolutionary infighting, I would say that peaks from the beginning, essentially. Not, not, it doesn't peak in the beginning. It happens from the beginning. So what is political violence, right? So when when Islamist revolutionaries round up the Shah's head of secret police and his top commanders and give them really kangaroo court you know, BS military tribunals with no real attorneys, legal defenses, juries, or uh, any of a way to appeal anything. And they were summarily executed. That's political violence from the beginning. And those, those executions spark debates from that beginning. Like, you know, should we be doing this? What, what are the, these are our enemies for sure. And they should be dealt with, but these, these trials seem a little bit kind of, what kind of system are we setting up if the trials are so fraught from with irregularities from the beginning? There's that, and then there's the infighting between the revolutionary factions that peaks in 1981-82 that leads to um, the killing of a lot of government personnel, including the president and prime minister, and then the killing of a lot of members of specific guerrilla organizations that fought the Shah and then also came to fight the the clergy, the militant clergy that was consolidating power. Montazeri was okay with all of this. Montazeri in the mid eighties, uh, well, before even the triumph of the revolution, he was Khomeini's deputy in Iran. So when Khomeini went as, was in exile, he was his representative in the country, and then he and then he's incarcerated, right, uh, by the Shah, and then he was tortured and he was made to listen to the torture of his son Mohammad Montazeri, right. So in a way, all those people that were imprisoned and tortured, um, they they that become that becomes part part of their political resume, their political bona fides. So a lot of the people that came to rule the government after the revolution are people who paid dues, political dues, and paid them with their bodies, right, and their minds. Montazeri was okay with a lot of the stuff that happened in the early eighties. What ends up happening is in the mid in the mid eighties, he is then. He goes from being he goes from being the deputy Khomeini's deputy in the seventies when Khomeini is in exile to becoming one of the framers of the Iranian constitution and, and instituting the whole idea of the rule of the jurisprudent, what we call in the West the supreme leader. And then in the mid eighties, he is designated officially the successor to Khomeini because Khomeini at the time was in his he was yeah he was in his mid eighties himself. So he's designated the successor to Khomeini. And then what happens is that uh, in the late 80s, 87, 88, uh, the government starts massacring political prisoners. Uh, part of that is because uh, it's it's really unfortunate. It's very horrific. It, it, it's one of those things that the Iranian government cannot live down to this very day. Uh, one of these guerrilla organizations uh, sides with Saddam Hussein. It fought the Shah. It tried to participate in the political space after the revolution. And then once it understood that the clergy is consolidating power at the expense of all the other factions that had made the revolution, they took up arms against the state. They were defeated within the country. They go into exile. The political leadership goes to Paris, France. And then uh, they set up a military base 
in Iraq um, at the time of the Iran-Iraq war. So a lot of Iranians saw them as siding with, with the enemy, essentially, right? Siding with Saddam Hussein. And I don't even want to mention their name. I'm intentionally leaving out their name because I don't want to speak their name. I don't know if you noticed that. I'm not even mentioning their name. Yeah, I'm mean, very intentional about it. Their name should not even be spoken, in my opinion. Um, then in the late 80s, when uh, after eight years of devastating war, where we don't really know how many Iranians died. I think maybe a mil- the, some estimates put it at a million and, and hundreds of thousands, maybe even also a million Iraqis. I think the death toll in the Iranians were, was, was more severe because Iran used human wave tactics in the war. Um, once the ceasefire was signed and was to be implemented two months later, this group, this Iranian exile group that had set up military bases in Iraq, launched an invasion of the country, thinking that it would lead to a mass uprising against the clergy. And it was defeated by the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and by a specific commander, a, co- a commander who led uh, the um, campaign against this invasion of the country. But like, I think like three, 400 guardsmen, Islamic Revolutionary Guardsmen died fighting. And the government was so upset not only about the death toll that they suffered, but what they what they saw as treason. And they went after a lot of the political prisoners that belonged to this organization that had conducted the invasion, but had nothing to do with the invasion. They, were, they had been in prison since the early 80s uh, for whatever BS political crimes they were accused of. Um, they were they were you know paying their so called debt to society. They were not involved in this up in this invasion, and as a as as vengeance against this organization, Khomeini basically ordered their massacre, the massacre of the political prisoners uh, in, in these prisons. the The growing repression of the state caught up a family member of the designated successor of Khomeini, Monta- Ayatollah Montazeri. I told Montazer his son-in-law's brother was not a member of this organization. But I think in 87, he was accused of leaking state secrets that ultimately led to the Iran-Contra uh, affair. It, it was leaked from within the Iranian government. This guy named, uh, I think it's Mehdi Hashemi or Mehdi Hashemi's brother. I forget. The, I get the names mixed up. It's been a while. And then the state executed him. And now these executions were hitting home, uh, the home of the of, of, of Montazeri. Um, and he saw he saw all the excesses. Like he had been kind of like watching it from the early eighties on. But then it, the, the excesses, the revolutionary excesses, the mass murder of political prisoners becomes so un- unbearable for Montazeri that he begins to write letters to Khomeini, saying, "Hey, we should like." How is it that we're creating an Islamic Republic? How is it that we are God-fearing clergymen and, and we're doing this? And Khomeini basically says, you're, you're believing the lives of the enemy, the specific organization in particular. And you don't, you're, you're showing how politically amateurish you are. And if you continue on to this, letter writing campaign, I, I will know how to deal with you. And Montazi continues with the letter writing campaign. And uh, he was essentially stripped of his successorship. And um, this is very late, by the way. This is late 80s. Khomeini died in 89, right? And uh, he was stripped of all his successorships and all that stuff. And then his actual successor then was the president of the Repo- Islamic Republic, uh, at the time, Hojatul al Muslimin Ali Khamenei, he was promoted to Ayatollah because you got to be an Ayatollah to be to to man that position of guardian jurist. And I say man intentionally because you got to be a man. And Monta- uh, Khamenei then places Montazeri under house arrest from 1997 to 2003, and only really releases him because he was getting so frail they didn't want him to die under house arrest because they didn't want to make a martyr out of him. Now. Montazeri published his memoirs, I think, in the year 2000. The memoirs, these, a lot of these memoirs are in Iran are written in a way where it's an interview. So someone's writing it and someone's having the, they're engaged, they're having, they're, que- they're interviewing and they're questioning and the answers. And that goes, it becomes a memoir where it's a long Q&A, essentially. And they asked Montazeri, like, why did you write these letters? Khomeini was old and frail. Y- y'all knew he was sick. Why didn't you just wait? 
wait him out. You were the designated successor. You had framed, you were one of the framers of the Iranian, the Islamist constitution. You were a deputy to Khomeini when he was in exile. You were tortured. You had played, you had paid all these dues. Why didn't you just keep quiet and become the successor? And if you had a problem with the executions, you could have just issued an edict or a fatwa or a fatwa in Arabic and you could have put, you could have put an end to these executions. And Mont- Montazeri basically gave an answer that I believe some people don't believe it. I believe it. He basically said, I'm a clergyman. I believe in the hereafter. I'm a Muslim. I believe in the hereafter. And I felt as one of the founders of the system, what it was doing, I felt like I was morally responsible for it. So I had a Islamic duty. A sh- he said shari. I had an Islamic law duty to try to put a stop to it. Because every person that was being killed, I felt responsible for it as one of the founders of the system. And I, I believe that. I believe I believe he believed that. Some people say that he's trying to clean up his image afterwards. No, I don't believe that for a second. And one last question, because you did mention Iran-Contra, and it's such a fascinating event. Did Rafsanjani, because Rafsanjani was basically buying weapons via Israel from the U.S., illegal weapons, and the profits of these weapon sales were going to fund the contracts in Nicaragua. But was this a... The, the U.S. was funding the contracts. Yes. Yes. And the profits from yes. the, the weapon sales that the U.S., because uh, the U.S. was selling to Iran, so the profits from these weapon sales were going to fund the contracts. But was this a thorn in the side of the Islamic Republic? Like, was this a big deal at the time? Like, how could you possibly buy these from the US. It, it was a big deal for everybody, right? So here was the Iranian government talking about the liberation of Palestine, uh, you know, fighting the Israelis, uh, down with the United States. And then it was secretly buying American weapons at super inflated prices f- through Israel of all countries, right? Uh, part of this is, for me, this is a moment where we could talk about pragmatism versus, versus ideology. The ideology of the Iranian state was Palestinian liberation, anti-U.S. imperialism across the region. But practically, this was the era of the Iran-Iraq war, and most of its hardware was American bought by the Shah. And you can't just go to a, a, a hardware store and buy a replacement piece. An American fighter jet, if, it's, if one of its pieces are damaged, you, that, that fighter jet is grounded. You can't use it in the context of a war. And you can't just go to the store and buy a replacement part. So it was not only just buying armaments, it was buying replacement parts. And it needed to to be able to conduct a war. So that's pragmatism superseding ideology. But when it was revealed, and it was revealed because Raf Sanjani was a point person. Uh, Raf Sanjani at the time was Speaker of Parliament. So he's part of the power structure. He was the point person on behalf of the Iranian state to conduct these trans- transactions very secretively. With Because there was an internal power struggle, people just didn't like each other within the system. Um, Ayatollah Montazeri's son-in-law's brother revealed this to the press, I think to the Lebanese press, actually, to discredit Afsan Jani, to push him aside. And it actually backfired. This is why he, I told the Montazeri's son-in-law's brother was executed was because that was a state secret he revealed. You know, he wasn't supposed to do that. So he was executed for releasing a state secret. So that embarrasses the Iranian government. But it also embarrasses the Americans because this is the same state that seized the U.S. embassy and held its staff hostage for 444 days. And it was illegal. The U.S. Congress had passed two pieces of legislation. One that was illegal to sell weapons to Iran and two, it was illegal to sell weapons to human rights violating Contras in Nicaragua. So now all of a sudden, the United States is being caught selling weapons to its new nemesis in the Middle East, Iran, and then violating Congress, congressional law by sending weapons to hardcore right-wing fascist Contras in Nicaragua. And then it angers the Iraqis, because Iraqis were fighting the Iranians in the Iran-Iraq war, and they were getting support from the United States. And they're like, how are you su- how are you supporting us with weapons and all these things and money and you're supporting our enemy at the same time during this war? So the Americans, the Iraqis were angry. They felt betrayed by their American allies. And America 
felt really embarrassed and, and Reagan almost Reagan almost got impeached by this. We'll talk about that in just a moment. To make up for this embarrassment with the Iraqis, America gets much more involved in the war on be, uh, to the benefit of the Iraqis. It, it leads to the tankers war and the downing of much of Iran's navy and all that stuff. Reagan was almost impeached for this because a lot, of, a lot of laws were broken for this. Reagan's whole thing was, I didn't know. And, the, and then the Reagan administration had fall guys to take the blame. And one was uh, Oliver North. Oliver North, like Hoysia, becomes a name known to a lot of Iranians of that generation. Oliver North's whole thing was, Reagan didn't know. I did this. I was rogue. I was this rogue like American who did what I did for the benefit of this country. You know, the, the Contras are fighting communists and... Uh, we needed the money, so we sold weapons uh, to Iranians to be able to fight communism, all that stuff. Everything's always done in the name of communism. So Reagan, Reagan is found guilty, and then, I'm oh, no, sorry, not Reagan. Oliver North is found guilty. Reagan pardons him. And then when Reagan's out of office, two or three years later, Oliver North comes out and says, Reagan knew everything. But what's he going to do? I'm already pardoned, and Reagan's out of part, uh, office. Sorry. It's kind of like the Shah when he pretended, like, or when people say he, he didn't know about the, the killings that were, um, ex like, the Savak's execution of political pr prisoners, and that the Shah didn't know about any of these things going on. Like, he didn't know what the underlings were doing, but of course he knew. And so... It's yeah, that was, that, was whole, that was the whole point of Savak. It was tr literally, literally, it was trained in Nazi torture techniques to stamp out dissent because it was a coup government. The coup happened in 53 and the Shah was installed. Uh, Savak was founded four years later to preserve that coup government that lacked legitimacy because it was installed by a foreign power. It was doing exactly what it was designed to do. And so when the Shah says, I didn't know, I mean, that's just convenient talk, right? Come on. And people, people want to believe what they want to believe. So a lot of the Shah's supporters in the diaspora believe him when they say he didn't know. It's just nonsense. It's nonsense. They're being willfully ignorant. Yeah, well, maybe we can change their minds. <laughs> and by the way, you know, half of these people are family members of mine. Yeah, exactly. I'm thinking <laughs> so, of you know what I mean? in my family right now. Yeah. All right, Puya. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. That was really fascinating. And um, maybe we can have you on another time to continue this talk on the history of the Iranian Revolution and the Green Uprisings and the current uprisings in Iran. Thank you for having me. It was a wonderful conversation. I appreciate uh, being invited to speak. And thank you for joining us at theanalysis.news. If you're in a position to donate, please do go to our website, theanalysis.news, and hit the donate button. We really can't do this without your support, so we appreciate all of your donations. Thank you. Mm -hmm.